the 6th of May, 2023. Charles and Camilla are crowned king and queen. In attendance are three generations of the royal family, including the king and queen's beloved grandchildren. The focus was not only on on the new king and his queen, of course, but also on the young children. And they very much represent the future of the royal family. Grandpa Wales and Gaga, as they are affectionately known, may well have brand new jobs, but their most important one is already well established. We all know grandparents are important, right? And they are really important in the royal family too. Charles and Camilla have 10 grandchildren between them. And while some are prince and princesses destined to lead the monarchy... I think Prince George is already like a wee king. Others will grow up outside the media spotlight. Their parents have kept them very private. However, they could all hold the key to the popularity of the royals. Charles, he has been thinking about the future of the royal family. Can they influence the king and queen to change and have a place in the lives of the next generation? The monarchy has to evolve. And what lessons can Charles learn from the relationships with his own grandparents to ensure that Grandpa Wales and Gaga have an everlasting bond with their grandchildren? Every generation in the monarchy changes what has gone before and creates the new normal. They need to set the template for the future because their grandchildren are going to be watching to see what it means to be royal in the 21st century. As Great Britain revels in the excitement of crowning its king and queen, Charles and Camilla are joined by their families to share this extraordinary moment. Three generations of the royals attend, showing the past, present, and future. So we have this 21st century blended family with two sets of grandchildren coming together. Charles and Camilla are divorcees. A lot of people relate to that, having uh, different families. So I think they're sort of setting an example and set bringing it up to date. <laughs> but they have their work cut out. They have to build the normal bonds that grandparents want to, but they also have to build the monarchy of the future. We must remember that when the queen became queen, she was only 25 years old. She had two young children. King Charles is already a grandfather. He's also a step-grandfather. King Charles is in his 70s, so his reign is going to be very different. What he's going to try and do is lay the foundation for those that follow. The key to this longevity lies not just with the generation below, but the generation even after that. Having 10 grandchildren between them, the role of Grandpa and Gaga has never been more important. Charles has five grandchildren, three from his son William and his wife Kate, George, Charlotte, and Louis. And of course, Archie and Lilibet, from his son Harry and his wife Meghan. Camilla also has five grandchildren. They are Lola and Freddie from Camilla's son Tom, and Eliza and twins Gus and Louis, to Laura, Camilla's daughter, When Prince William and Catherine Middleton married on the 29th of April, 2011, it marked a new era for the royal family. Later the following year, it was announced that Kate was expecting. Thank you very much. Joyous news for both the family and the public. Babies are gorgeous, time for celebration in all families. But when it comes to the royal family, you need to know that there are heirs. In the summer of 2013, Charles and the world eagerly awaited the birth of his first grandchild. There were all those crowds waiting outside St Mary's Paddington, the Lindo Wing, for hours and hours. And I think anybody's first grandchild is a big deal, but knowing that this child was going to be the monarch one day 
was very, very exciting for the public. We welcome with humble duty a future king. On the 22nd of July, Britain celebrated the new addition to the royal family. An historic moment for the nation. I was really honoured to be able to post that official notice on the railings of Buckingham Palace. And I felt I played a tiny, tiny part in a historic event. The declaration, like the baby, was small but hugely significant. Reading simply, Her Royal Highness was safely delivered of a son at 4.24 p.m. She and her child are both doing well. Charles visited the uh, Lindo wing shortly after, and he was absolutely delighted. You wait and see, you'll see in a minute. I know from speaking to, to friends and colleagues how excited the king was to become a grandparent for the first time. Prince George Alexander Louis was finally shown to the waiting world by his proud parents. Charles was determined to be a devoted grandfather from the start. It's often easier to be a really happy, devoted grandparent than it sometimes is to be a, a parent. There are far more stresses and strains, and of course, he had a really difficult time with William and Harry at different points. A complicated relationship, particularly uh, when he was separating from Diana, their mother, and then, of course, Diana's death. Could he have done more? Could he have behaved more like a mother than a father? That's between him and his conscience, but he has the opportunity to pay it forward. But as William and Kate adjusted to being new parents, bonding with his new grandson proved challenging for Charles. Quite understandably, Kate and William retreated from the public world and they went to go and stay with Kate's parents, Michael and Carol Middleton. When George was born, he was almost straight away whisked off to the Middleton's house in Berkshire. Kate had a little baby that cried all the time. George was, you know, a very noisy and loud baby. So, of course, she wanted to go to her mum. So, in the early years, I'm sure the Middleton's grandma and grandpa Middleton did see more of George than that Charles did. As I was told by some of his friends, Charles felt a bit pushed out. He felt that he wasn't really being able to see his grandson. After all, this was the future king. As time's gone on, I think that's become a lot better. As the first child of Prince William, George is now second in line to the throne, which means he's often the center of attention as when the world watched him on his first day at school. And being in the spotlight at such a young age isn't easy. He's actually quite shy. George isn't a natural show-off. George reminds me a little bit of uh, Prince William when he was young. I used to follow William and, and, and Harry around with Diana all over the world. And Harry was always the lively one, and uh, William would be quite, quite withdrawn in, in, in many ways, not quite so gung-ho. And sometimes looking at George, he reminds me of him. He doesn't always look at happy being in the spotlight. But I'm sure that uh, when he grows up, he will change and he will blossom just like William has. I think Prince George has the best qualities of both his parents. I think he comes across as a quite a shy individual, but then, when he smiles, his smile lights up the room. Behind the scenes, Kate and William, they guard the privacy of their children very, very closely. So we don't really see them kind of in their natural habitat. But what we do know, having spoken to friends of William and Kate's, is that George loves playing football, for example. When they were still living in London, he played for a local, I think, seven-a-side team, and he absolutely loved it. I think George really comes alive when he's playing sport. Oh, how's that? Kate and William want their children, particularly George, to have as normal and natural a life as possible, and that's because of what Prince William had to go through when he was growing up. 
I wonder how much Kate and William's protectiveness resonates with King Charles himself. He wants to protect his grandchildren in a way that he couldn't always protect his children. But Charles is also well aware of the unique pressures a future king will face and is determined to guide George along that path. Charles was only three when his grandfather, George VI, died, so he wasn't able to have any kind of grandparental input from his grandfather, the king. And so I think he was very conscious that he wanted to be there in a sort of dynastic sense for his grandson. It does fall upon Charles to educate his grandson in the ways of the monarchy. Not completely, but just to make sure that he's aware in a way that the Queen did with William. King Charles is, is very aware of the sort of double obligation he's got, if you like, towards that next generation. Charles sees his role not just as the protector, Charles sees his role also as one of an educator. To ensure their bond, Charles and George have spent plenty of time together at the King's country home, Highgrove. Highgrove is the King's private residence in uh, Gloucestershire. It's very dear to him. He's built it up over 40 or so years. He made play areas for William and Harry, and he's done exactly the same for his uh, grandchildren. Charles has tried to make the house as welcoming as he can, because, of course, he wants his grandchildren there. And Charles has even encouraged George to follow in his footsteps when it comes to gardening. Charles is famous for his green fingers. We know that he adores creating stunning gardens. And he has often spoken about planting a tree with George and trying to educate George. The most important thing is I got him planting a tree or two here. So we planted it together and shoveled it in the earth. Because that's the way, I think, when you're very small. Yeah. And, and then you see, you know, each time they come, you say, do you see how much the tree's grown or whatever? And you hope that they take an interest. And that really came out in the arboretum that he planted and the wood that he named after Prince George. Charles let cameras into the garden at his home in Scotland during this intimate extract from a TV documentary to celebrate his 70th birthday. It's really George's wood. So it'd be quite amusing for him, I hope, really as they grow up and he grows up. The king has always been passionate about the environment and we are only now really appreciating what he thought of and spoke about years ago. When we read that over the next 60 years, if we go on as we are doing, something like a third of all the forms of life at present living on this planet may be extinct, can we feel anything but a kind of cosmic horror. We know that Charles's environmentalism, as he's got older, has often been connected to thinking about his grandchildren, thinking about their future. What sort of planet are they going to have? I worry about your grandchildren and everybody else's grandchildren, as well as my own. And it just seemed to me that I couldn't possibly face my grandchildren or yours uh, at the end of the day, when we've completely mucked up the whole of our environment. I think that's what Charles feels, very much feels, that time is moving so quickly and he's running out. So he has to instill in his grandchildren, you know, what they have to do for the future, because he won't be here to do it. Charles got his love of nature and of gardening and the environment from his father and indeed his grandmother. So he definitely wants to pass that on to, uh, to George. I believe Charles is trying very hard to inculcate some of the values that he holds dear. For instance, the ideas about climate change, sustainability, the importance of the countryside. You have to remember that away from the cameras, what the royals love doing more than anything is country pursuits. He takes George fishing, just the two of them, which is lovely. George loves animals. He's certainly got quite a good interest in conservation. So I think that relationship with Prince George is charming because it comes across that he's trying to help him learn the importance of nature, but in a very normal, natural way. 
Charles's strong bond with his first grandchild would be vital to the future and the continuation of the monarchy. The connection between Charles and George has an extra dimension to it because George will follow in Charles's footsteps. And Charles's guiding hand would be even more poignant as he himself had grown up without the presence of a grandfather. So who had been his guides through childhood and beyond? And what lessons did they teach him that he could pass on to the next generation? King Charles is very keen that his grandchildren don't make the mistakes that I think he feels he made. Even though Charles's title has changed and he's now the king, he's still known in his family by another name. The royals love a nickname, and it was George who first called Charles Grandpa Wales. I think he's an incredibly warm, genuine, fun-loving individual. So I can only see him being an extraordinarily hands-on grandfather. We don't actually see a lot in uh, public of, of Charles and George interacting, but with the late Queen, they were uh, making a Christmas pudding together, and it was very funny when George really got stuck into the stirring. Charles is helping to prepare his grandson to be king one day, and it's clear George is beginning to understand those responsibilities. George, in many ways, like his father and grandfather, is quite a serious little boy. I think Prince George is already like a wee king. You can just tell from his body language, how he carries himself, that he knows, even though he's really young, he knows that one day all of this will be his. George is learning how to stand up straight, shake hands, behave like a royal. He will be picking things up. There's a sort of form of osmosis going on here. He will observe how his father does things, but crucially also how the king does things. George goes along to all these big occasions. He's there on the balcony. He sees everything that's going on, just as a very small William did and a very small Charles before him. And Prince George was there uh, front and center for the uh, coronation of his grandfather. I think it was important to get him involved uh, Charles very much wanted to do that. Um, he's got to get used to all these state occasions. When we looked at the King's page boys, the most significant one was the youngest one, Prince George, who himself will one day be crowned King. You can't imagine what was going through his head. He is fully aware, even at his young age, that that is his future writ large. It's clear that the, the bond and the connection between Charles and George has an extra dimension to it because George will follow in Charles's footsteps. And I think Charles has that urge to pass on that wisdom and experience that he has accumulated in the 70 years that he has waited to be on the throne. Charles's own experience of the role grandparents can play is mixed. Both his grandfathers died when he was very young. Prince Philip's father, Prince Andrew, died before Charles was born, and Charles was only three when his mother's father, King George VI, died in 1952. There's one photograph of Charles and his grandfather, and Charles has got his little chubby legs, he's wearing shorts. It's absolutely charming. Prince Philip's mother eventually in her old age, lived at Buckingham Palace. She would wear a nun's habit. Princess Alice, she was completely deaf, so she wasn't an easy person to communicate with. So he didn't have much of a relationship with her. It was his grandmother, the Queen Mum, who stepped into this void to become a consoling figure and shoulder to lean on for Charles. Charles learned from her exactly what is needed to be a loving grandparent. Charles and the Queen Mother were incredibly close. Charles has often talked about how difficult it was as a young child not seeing his parents for months at a time because they were away on official duties. But the one person who was constantly there was the Queen Mother. So she really kind of fulfilled that maternal role that 
his mother couldn't because she literally wasn't there. And they had a lot of things in common. She was happy at Balmoral in a headscarf and Wellington boots, walking the dogs. She loved the outdoors, which was passed on to her grandchildren. She had a great sense of humour. Charles is also really funny. They both loved the arts, they both loved drama, they both loved music. He had a huge, huge amount of input from his grandmother, which is why he was so fond of her. Prince Charles had a special hug for the Queen Mother and a kiss When it was Princess time for Charles to go to boarding school, the Queen Mother desperately tried to protect him. Prince Philip wanted to send Charles to Gordonston, the very tough boarding school in Scotland that he himself had gone to. The Queen Mother didn't want that for Charles. She realised he was a sensitive soul and uh, she wrote uh, and told the Queen that she thought uh, he'd be much better off going to Eton and he would much more enjoy it, but Prince Philip was determined to send him to Gordonston, which he didn't, uh, didn't take to at all and uh, was bullied badly and hated every minute of it. There obviously was some regret about that schooling decision. It didn't work out for Charles, and um, perhaps in retrospect, they may have done things differently. But what it did demonstrate was that the Queen Mother always had Charles's best interests at heart. Aside from the Queen Mother, Charles's closest relative growing up was undoubtedly Louis Mountbatten, his paternal great uncle. Earl Mountbatten was a cousin of the Queen and was also related to Prince Philip. He was effectively Charles's honorary grandfather. The two men were very, very close. He was a mentor. He was somebody that Charles could go to. He could spend hours and hours talking to him. And in a way that he just didn't have that relationship with his own father. By the 1970s, when the young Charles was one of the most eligible bachelors in the world, he again leaned on the experienced cosmopolitan Mountbatten for advice. It was Mountbatten who warned Charles of the unsuitability of a certain Camilla Shand. There are various stories about whether Charles missed his chance to, to pop the question to Camilla, but they were definitely an item in the early 70s. He did meet the woman of his dreams, and that woman was Camilla. But lots of people didn't feel it was appropriate, particularly Lord Mountbatten, who had a very traditional view of who the future king should partner up with. He thought Charles should be with some kind of ingenue who was still a virgin. And that's why he was very much steering Charles clear of, of Camilla. While he was away, she married Andrew Parker Bowles. Um, but at some point in the 70s, that relationship rekindled. Probably what would have been better for everybody is if people had just let Charles marry the person he had wanted to marry from the start. I think King Charles is very keen that his grandchildren don't make the mistakes that I think he feels he made in not standing up for what he wanted, particularly when it came to matters of the heart. And therefore, I think what he wants to do is to try and help these young grandchildren grow up in as normal a way as possible and create more fully rounded human beings who are unafraid of their emotions and who are able to have the confidence to marry whom they want and to have a happy, successful and fulfilled personal life. Charles had two close older relatives who were dear to him, and that closeness has fueled the love for his own grandchildren. But although Charles now has Camilla at his side, this is bringing challenges that no other monarch has faced. Step grandchildren. And forming natural close bonds isn't always easy. William has said that Camilla is very much the wife of his father and not, uh, not a step-grandmother, so I think that, that gives you an indication of the relationship. So what part will the new queen play in the life of the young royals? Well, I don't think, to be honest, there is a huge amount of relationship between Camilla and George. As anyone from a blended family will tell you, it's quite tricky. Although Prince William is delighted that King Charles and his grandson George have a close bond, there is more caution around Queen Camilla. 
Well, William has said that Camilla is very much the wife of his father and not, uh, not a step-grandmother, so I think that, that gives you an indication of the relationship. Camilla, I think, has always been very sensitive to not overstep her role. And so I don't think, to be honest, there is a huge amount of relationship between Camilla and George. Although, obviously, they see each other at family events all the time. As anyone from a blended family will tell you, it's quite tricky, every different dynamic, to try and make them all work. But when it comes to grandchildren, Camilla had a head start on Charles. Camilla's children with Andrew Parker Bowles are around 10 years older than William and Harry. So Camilla's grandchildren were on the scene just that touch earlier. Camilla first became a grandparent in 2007 when granddaughter Lola was born to her son Tom and his then wife, Sara. Camilla is one of those women that is really good with young children. Camilla absolutely adores being a grandparent. Camilla's strengths are in having a very stable, emotional family background and a very loving set of children and grandchildren. And she's been able to help Charles negotiate that road with his own children and more importantly, I think, with his grandchildren. Not only that, but Charles loves to spend time with her grandchildren, and they love spending time with him. Charles has a very good relationship with his um, step-grandchildren. He's been very included in, in their lives ever since Ian and Camilla properly got together. Charles had a bit of a sort of trial run uh, with Camilla's grandchildren and uh, probably learned a lot from interacting with them. So he sort of learnt the ropes there. On the 2nd of May 2015, William and Kate unveiled to the world a new addition to their family, Princess Charlotte Elizabeth Diana. And just like her mum and dad, Grandpa was thrilled. Charles was delighted when Charlotte was born because he'd always wanted a daughter. So Charlotte coming along is that opportunity for him to be this sort of doting granddad. And he also joked that um, he was very happy to have a girl because um, when she was older, she could look after him. The public were delighted to see William and Kate's family grow. One royal wave, two small children and a grand entrance. Prince George and Princess Charlotte do not have a diary of official engagements. And for Charlotte, this was her first. Charlotte's arrival was special for another reason too, one that reflects a more progressive monarchy. In 2011, the Queen changed the law on the line of succession, so it doesn't just favor male heirs. This means now that Princess Charlotte will be the first royal princess not to lose her place in the line of succession, which is wonderful. She's third in line to the throne, and she could have a very, very important role, because if, if George doesn't have any children, for example, she could become queen one day and her children would follow on from her. Princess Charlotte is growing up to be a confident girl, as seen when she takes part in royal events. It appears to me that Princess Charlotte has no qualms at all about being in the spotlight on public events. She's been a flower girl for at least two royal weddings, that of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and of Princess Eugenie, and she obviously enjoys it. <laughs> Charlotte has got a, a, an absolutely terrific personality. She's brave, she's quite forceful, she certainly lords it up over her older brother. I remember George being quite bossy, but I think the dynamic has changed. Recently, on the big public occasions, we've seen uh, Charlotte uh, taking charge and ordering George around. I think Charlotte follows in the true tradition of tough Windsor women. I think the one thing that everybody really noted about Charlotte was the resemblance to the late queen. You know, people could really see that strongly in her features and her mannerisms. I think she puts me very, very much in mind of how Princess Anne was as a little girl. Charles was very shy and reticent, 
and wouldn't put up with any nonsense from anyone. And I, un I just feel that Charlotte has those attributes. Charlotte comes across as a very confident young person, doesn't she? And, and I think having role models like her mother and Camilla must help her grow in confidence in her public role. I think she's very much the one in charge. At one point at the Queen's funeral, as the coffin goes past her, she was telling George what to do. Whether it's to the big brother or the little brother, sisters are very often bossy, and Charlotte is no exception. And at the Jubilee, Trooping the Colour, we saw them in this marvellous open-top carriage. Louis being Louis goes completely over the top and won't stop, and then bossy Charlotte says, that's enough. And it, it was very sweet, but you could also see almost a window into the future, because I think once a bossy big sister, always a bossy big sister. But even Charlotte can't completely control her younger brother. Born on the 23rd of April 2018, Prince Louis Arthur Charles is the third of the King's grandchildren. And Grandpa Wales bonded with him from the start. Even Louis's name points to a deep connection with his grandfather, named after Louis Mountbatten, the beloved relative of Charles. I love Prince Louis. He is the cheeky chappy who just lights up any royal occasion. I can't think of anyone who would not have a smile on their face when they watch Prince Louis at these events. His facial expressions have become kind of memes on social media. He's been an absolute hit on the internet. I remember the Platinum Jubilee and the balcony attendance, which I think was the last balcony attendance that the late Her Majesty the Queen was on. And seeing that amazing fly past of RAF aircrafts and then laughing because Prince Louis put his, his hands over his ears to try and drown out the roar of the aircrafts. Everybody remembers the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. He looked a real handful. The Platinum Jubilee at the pageant, which was quite a long event, we all noticed that Prince Louis was messing around a bit. He obviously got a bit bored. And in the end, uh, Kate sent him to go and sit on Grandpa's knee. And, of course, Charles looked completely enamoured and delighted by it. He was the doting grandfather, and Louis seemed to be loving every minute of it. I thought it was actually quite a nice glimpse into the fact that they clearly have got a very close relationship. King Charles feels very comfortable to sort of soothe him and calm him down. And Charles has certainly had a lot of practice getting the attention of cheeky children. From father, a young pianist needs a cue on where to look. Charles, of course, is a father of two sons. Uh, just two years between them, they were a bit of a handful growing up, William and Harry, and Charles knows what it's like. Louis very much looks like the joker of the pack. Um, he reminds me of Harry at the same age. He'd always be the one who was up for a lark. No doubt Charles can see those similarities, too, between Louis and Harry. Maybe that's why he and Louis are so close. I think what Charles is uh, very pleased to be seeing in his grandchildren is that they're being allowed to have a freedom and a childhood unfettered um, by the requirements that were imposed on him. I think Charles has really grown into his role as a grandparent, and certainly when I spoke to Camilla about him being a doting grandfather, Camilla told me that it was lovely to see Charles spend time with his grandchildren. William confirmed that Grandpa Wales is a much-requested presence during this revealing chat as part of Charles's 70th birthday TV tribute. Does he have time to be a grandfather on top of everything else? It, it's something I'm working more heavily on, put it that way. I think he, he does have time for it, but I would like him to have more time with the children. When he's there, he's brilliant, um, but we need him there as much as possible. William and Kate will have really appreciate that William's father, the king, 
is incredibly busy, but still takes time to be with his grandchildren because he knows how important it is. I'm sure he would want to see much more of them, but it's, again, a, a really difficult balancing act, being the monarch and being a grandfather. That balance would soon prove to be even more challenging for the king. When Prince Harry married Meghan Markle in 2018, the extended royal family grew again and it would mean further grandchildren for Charles. I'm very excited to announce that uh, Meghan and myself had a baby boy. But an explosive rift would see the Sussexes escape overseas. What happened with Harry and Meghan destroyed so much of that glow of early happiness. Creating a painful gulf between the generations. It's one of the saddest things about the whole mess that uh, Charles really hasn't seen much of his Sussex grandchildren. In 2018, Prince Harry married Meghan Markle. Meghan, a successful American actor, was very different from previous royal brides. The most important way in which Meghan differed from Harry's other girlfriends, or indeed from other members of the royal family, was the fact that she is biracial. As soon as the wedding was over, people started speculating and thinking about the future. Children, we were going to have biracial children in the royal family. Meghan Markle's arrival is very significant for the royal family. She is biracial. Her children are going to be a quarter African-American. That sounds like a tiny amount to anyone who lives in the normal world, but in the royal world, it is a huge transformation and a huge change. Charles and Camilla must have been very aware of how progressive a non-white grandchild would be for the royal family. In many ways, the birth of Harry and Meghan's first child was going to be even more significant than the birth of Prince George. The family is intermarrying across cultures and races and creeds and colors. It signifies that the royal family is happy to literally and symbolically embrace diversity. They had a really massive golden opportunity sending a signal out to, to multicultural yeah, Britain that actually somebody who looks a bit like you has got a place in this family. And in May 2019, the world received the joyful news that a new royal baby had been born to the couple. From the moment he stepped out in the Royal Muse at Windsor Castle this afternoon, there was no hiding the elation on the face of this new dad. A delighted Prince Harry announced the birth of his son, Archie, to the world. Um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Meghan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Archie is King Charles's fourth grandchild. I think it's a really big moment that we have got biracial children in the, the royal family. The Queen wanted Harry to go out as her ambassadors throughout the Commonwealth, and their children would have been great, uh, great for the royal family as well. They would really have been representing modern multicultural Britain. I am here with you as a mother, as a wife, as a woman, as a woman of colour, and as your sister. While in public, it appeared that Meghan seemed to relish her new role as both a mother and a royal. Behind the scenes, the couple were increasingly unhappy with royal life and were making plans to leave Britain. I feel very dismayed that we had the first non-white person, the first biracial, mixed-race woman to come into the royal family. It was a moment of, of advancement and modernity and progress and look what happened. After departing for California, the Sussexes gave a tell-all interview to Oprah Winfrey, giving their side of the story. And Charles's youngest grandchild, Archie, hit the headlines for all the wrong reasons. In this shocking but revealing clip, Meghan disclosed that an unnamed member of the royal family had asked 
how dark-skinned baby Archie would be. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? It sent absolute shockwaves, not just throughout the UK, but throughout the world, with headlines of the royal family is racist. And while a stunned Charles was left speechless... Sir, can I ask, what did you think of the interview? It was left to William to reply. I'm very much not a racist man. This alleged conversation about speculating about the colour of the child's skin isn't even mentioned in Harry's book. And he's now accusing the media of accusing the royal family of being racist. In this exclusive ITV interview with Tom Bradby, Harry attempts to clarify what was said by Meghan in that infamous Oprah interview. In the Oprah interview, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even... We didn't. Well, of... The British press said that. Right. I... Did, did Meghan ever mention that they were racist? She said there were troubling comments about yeah, Archie's skin There was skin concern colour. about his skin colour. Right. Wouldn't you describe that as essentially racist? I wouldn't, not having lived within that family. Right. Now, funnily enough, sometime later, in a subsequent interview that Prince Harry did, he denied that he had accused the royal family of being racist and said actually what it was was unconscious bias, not racism. So that is one of many controversial parts of the whole story. Did that conversation even happen? We don't know. Whatever the truth, it's clear a wedge has been driven between the two families. The unintended consequence of which is that Archie has rarely seen Grandpa Wales or Gaga. Archie was born in the May, and I think then Meghan and Harry left for Canada in the November. And I remember a friend of Charles telling me that I think he'd only seen Archie twice in that time. I think it's one of the saddest things about the whole mess that uh, Charles really hasn't seen much of his, his uh, Sussex uh, grandchildren. For the foreseeable future, it looks like Archie will be growing up in America, completely cut off from his royal relatives. I think the royal family have missed a huge opportunity. One of the big challenges facing the royal family they're going to fight for relevancy, they're going to fight for status and affection, particularly with a changing Britain. Having an American branch of the royal family could be a really positive thing, both in terms of the PR, but also in terms of bringing the family closer together, making them seem more modern, more in touch. In 2021, Harry and Meghan became proud parents for a second time. In a hospital in Santa Barbara, Meghan gave birth to a baby daughter. In America, the news of the royal birth was greeted with surprise and delight. So cute. We can't wait a baby here. It's so it's cute. It's a royal, it's baby. a royal baby yeah. here in town. Yeah, it's so cool. We couldn't be prouder. <laughs> <laughs> that they chose Montecito to have a baby. Their new arrival was named Lilibet Diana after the late Queen and Harry's mother, Diana, Princess of Wales. The name Lilibet comes from a nickname that the Queen herself was given because when she was small, she couldn't pronounce her own name, which is Elizabeth. Well, there were certainly eyebrows raised when it was announced. It's a, a very intimate nickname. I mean, it's not used by wider members of the royal family. Meghan and Harry wanted to honor Queen Elizabeth but also remind the rest of the world, excuse me, we're royals too. And it wasn't just the controversy about Lilibet's name that surprised observers. In an unguarded moment, Thank the Duchess you. of Cambridge revealed that the royal family had yet to see the newest addition to the family. I can't wait to meet her, because we haven't yet, um, yet met her yet, so hopefully that will be soon. Have you made fun with her? No, I haven't, no. <laughs> I actually think it's devastating that Charles has literally no relationship with Archie and Lilibet. He's only met Lilibet once. That was when she came over with her parents for the Platinum Jubilee. Charles may not have a relationship with his youngest grandchildren, but since he became king, a big change has happened in their lives. Archie and Lilibet are now officially a prince and princess. 
cameras. <laughs> Being a prince or a princess is in your blood. It doesn't matter uh, where you live, whether it's Windsor or Montecito. It would only happen, though, on the death of the Queen and their grandfather, Charles, becoming the king, because grandchildren of monarchs are prince and princesses. But being a prince or princess in California, outside of the royal family, is going to be far from easy. They will be bringing them up in California, but uh, it is absolutely their right to use those titles whenever they want to. Americans, as, as we know, are, you know, love all those titles, but we don't know if they will in, in, you know, 20 years' time. It might be a real hindrance. When her children were born, Princess Anne turned down titles for them. And while her son and daughter, Peter and Zara, are still in the line of succession, they have grown up plain old Mr and Miss. I think that Princess Anne was, was absolutely right, and she was very far-sighted. To, to be thinking that in the future these titles are going to be a nuisance. Princess Anne is really lauded for trying to get as normal a childhood as possible for her children. They're still part of the royal family, but they, they've been able to have their own business uh, careers, make their own money, and be a bit more normal than uh, their, their cousins. I think not having a title potentially gives you more freedom to pursue your own interests. And of course, Zara Tyndall, as we all know, was a, an Olympic show jumper, rider, representing Great Britain. You can't have the privilege without the responsibility. Now, Archie and Lilibet are going to have the privilege of the title, the style, but without the responsibility. And that is not a good idea. And although they are royals by birth, Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet missed out on seeing their grandfather crowned. One of the possible reasons Meghan couldn't make the coronation was that it coincided with another big day, Archie's fourth birthday. I am 99.9% .9 sure that the choice of the coronation date had nothing to do with anybody's birthday, <laughs> including Archie's. There were lots and lots of different moving parts when you choose such an important event. It's not just an event where you have to check whether your nearest and dearest can make it, like, you know, at a normal wedding or something like that. And despite his fatherhood obligations, after an apparent heart-to-heart -heart with Charles, Harry decided to attend the coronation. It is quite a twist of fate that the coronation is taking place on Archie's fourth um, birthday. And it's quite bittersweet because, of course, Archie is not going to, to, to be there. Young children wouldn't traditionally be present at a coronation, so Lilibet and Archie, both probably too young, they wouldn't necessarily have been at the coronation, but I'm sure they would have been at other events over the coronation weekend if they had come from California to London to be part of the event with their mother, Meghan. While Lilibet and Archie miss out on the coronation, at least Charles can take some consolation from his other grandchildren being there. And in an unprecedented break with tradition, Charles's non-royal step-grandchildren play a prominent part in the big day. From a personal point of view for Camilla, she wants to have her loved family members around her, and that's lovely. It was so clear that there was a strong message coming out from the visuals from the coronation. Yes, Camilla is now the queen. She is also a grandmother. On the 6th of May, 2023, King Charles and Queen Camilla were crowned in front of ecstatic crowds. But this centuries-old ceremony was very different from his mother's. The difference between King Charles's coronation and that of his mother, and that scale, uh, the 1953 coronation was immense. The pomp and pageantry was ratcheted up to sort of Mach 10. The nice thing was that uh, because uh, Charles and uh, Camilla were in their mid-70s, as opposed to the Queen, who was 27, uh, their family were all there, so they were able to find a role for the grandchildren. I think it was so clear that there was a strong message coming out from the visuals from the coronation. Yes, Camilla is now the Queen. She is also a grandmother. 
And for Camilla especially, it was important that her grandchildren had a role in the ceremony. Charles and Camilla are including their grandchildren in the coronation because this is a family affair as well as a state affair. The children are the future. And from a personal point of view for Camilla, she wants to have her loved family members around her, and that's lovely. Yes, they don't have royal blood, but they have her blood, and they are the people who she loves the most, apart from her children and her husband, of course. So that was very touching. In total, Camilla is a proud grandmother to five grandchildren. Her son, Tom, has a son and daughter, Lola and Freddie. And her daughter, Laura, has three children, Eliza and the twins, Gus and Louis. Camilla's journey to become queen has been far from easy. For many years, she was vilified in the press for her role as the other woman in Charles's marriage. It is unsurprising that Camilla's family have tried to protect her grandchildren and have, up until now, shunned the media spotlight. For so long, I think Camilla was really disliked by the public. We know that Tom was teased endlessly at school because of his mother being the future king's mistress, the marriage breaker. She's not always had the best press. And naturally, you know, she's wanted to shield her own children and grandchildren from possible adverse publicity. It's only now that Camilla has become queen and attitudes toward her have changed that she feels able to expose her grandchildren to the full glare of the media. She had to fight a great deal of prejudice over many years, and she's done it by, not by grandstanding, not by trying to steal the limelight, but just by being there and being really at Charles's side. We see a very confident Camilla who is now happy to allow the media spotlight to feature her extended family, including her young grandchildren. It's really nice now that she feels able to show herself as a grandmother and to invite her family to be part of this royal life. In 2005, Camilla and Charles were married, and Tom and Laura got a royal step-parent. And despite now having King Charles as their stepfather, in an interview on Good Morning Britain, Tom revealed that they don't regard themselves as part of the royal family. But not quite part of the royal family, to be honest. My, my mother well, married you, look, you, she's you're part kind of it. into that world, is what we're, I mean. We're the, we're the common children, you know, we're just the, <laughs> on the side. Do you know so what? I don't think that's how we think of you. I yeah. think we do think that you're part of an extended royal family. It's interesting that you don't. I think they'd be appalled to think that was part of it. Uh, <laughs> Despite her busy life as queen and working royal, Camilla always makes time to see her grandchildren. I think Camilla comes across as an excellent grandparent. One of the reasons that Camilla kept her house, Ray Mill House in Wiltshire, was because it's very close to where her son and daughter live in the Cotswolds. There's obviously a real intimacy there. We're told that very often when she's in Wiltshire, Camilla will go and collect one of her granddaughters from their schools. She's been very good, actually, I think, about keeping that side of her life going. In fact, for Easter Sunday this year, she left the church service a little bit early because she was going off to have Easter Sunday lunch with her family. Doting grandmother Camilla has been keen to pass on to her grandchildren one of her greatest passions. We know that Camilla is is a big reader. She does a lot of charity work for literacy. And as Camilla revealed in this interview with the children's laureate, Joseph Coilo, she loves nothing more than encouraging her grandchildren's love of reading. It was a lovely, it was just a wonderful way of, of getting to know them, you know, of, of, as you say, bonding, sitting on the end of their bed and, and just reading. You know, we, we took it in turns to, to find our favourite stories. And what's lovely, it, it, it's really got them reading. Mm. I mean, properly reading. Um, they are bookworms, right? 
she enjoys spending time with them, reading stories, particularly apparently uh, Gangster Granny is, is a, is a favourite. She often talks about her grandchildren and how proud she is of their love of literature and reading and how she buys them books, whether it's the Philip Pullman books or the Dracula for some of her grandsons. As well as a love of reading, Camilla and her grandchildren also share some other interests. Grandsons Gus and Louis have introduced their grandmother to a new pastime. Gus and Louis, they've introduced her to modern things like TikTok. She talks about doing Wordle with one of her granddaughters every day and how satisfying it is when she beats her. Camilla is a devoted granny, actually, and what's so lovely is that every year she goes on bucket and spade holidays with all her grandchildren. I think she, she feeds off the, off the grandchildren, and I think they keep her young. I think one of Camilla's great strengths is that she's got real-world experience, and, and I think that gives her a dynamic, if you like, a handle on what's going on in the world, uh, which is useful to the king. And Camilla has a very special way of showing her love for her grandchildren to the public. At the coronation, Camilla had the names of her grandchildren sewn onto her dress. We know that Camilla is devoted to her grandchildren, so much so that she wears it not quite on her heart, but round her neck. We often see her wearing this very sweet pendant, which has the five initials of her five grandchildren. She's inherited and been given lots of big diamonds recently, but uh, that necklace is special. And it's not just Camilla who enjoys spending time with her grandchildren. Camilla has told us that Charles and the step-grandchildren get on like a house on fire. Camilla has said they absolutely adore him. Um, they call him Umpa, apparently. In this exclusive BBC interview filmed for the King's 70th birthday, Camilla revealed that Charles is a very hands-on step-grandparent. He will get down on his knees and crawl about with them for hours, you know, they're making funny noises and, and laughing. And my grandchildren adore him, absolutely adore him. He reads Harry Potter and he can do all the different voices, and I think children really appreciate that. Camilla and Charles enjoy nothing more than spending family time with her grandchildren at Burke Hall, their home in the Highlands. Charles and Camilla love Burke Hall. I think it's probably their favourite place on earth. And sometimes she'll take all the grandchildren up and Charles will be there, which is lovely. And that's where I'm sure the king will feel relaxed. It's when those doors shut and the crown comes off where he can be a grandfather. And while King Charles and Camilla's grandchildren have been brought together at the coronation, their futures are going to be completely different. I think the message that, that Charles was sending out was that it's all about the future. He wants to make sure that whoever comes after him has a plan, knows what they're doing, and is ready to take on the mantle. King Charles and Queen Camilla are loving and devoted grandparents. And as their grandchildren grow up, what role will Gaga and Grandpa Wales play in their lives? I think the message that, that Charles was sending out by including the, the, these young pages of honour was that it's all about the future. For Charles, it's crucial uh, in, in securing the future, if you like, in making sure that every aspect of this very well-oiled machine runs smoothly. They're teaching their grandchildren that you can be both a royal and a private person all at the same time. Camilla and Charles have been concerned for years about the future and creating a lasting legacy. Charles is very conscious that he's not going to have a very long stint at being king. So he's a man in a hurry. But I think that Charles feels that, um, A, his obsession with the planet, and he really worries about that, and he feels we're running out of time. Charles has always seen um, the future of the monarchy and the future of mankind and the planet, if you like, as entwined. Most recently, during a visit to a car factory in Oxford, King Charles was clear about the importance of developing green technology for the generations to come. 
the development of technology like electric vehicles or green hydrogen for that matter for heavy transport is vital for maintaining the health of our world for future generations something i'm only too aware of today having recently become a grandfather for the fifth time if the grandchildren in the royal family take on board this issue they will be heading up a worldwide movement and they'll be showing that they're not completely out of touch with the rest of the young populace of the world. And while Charles has always been a step ahead with environmental issues, Camilla has been developing her own legacy. There are lots of moving parts to monarchy and the way it works best is when each complements the other. Camilla sees her role very much as supporting the king, taking on um, a number of key interests which very much complement what he's doing. Camilla, the Queen, is doing this work uh, this very much to do with literacy. Kate herself has got a, a, an early years project, and you can see that when the time comes, there will be something to hand on to Charlotte. And when it comes to the royal family, Charles has been making plans to take the monarchy into the 21st century. Even though he's only nine years old, Prince George must be aware of the heavy responsibilities that await him. Seeing him at the coronation, it can't have escaped his thought at some stage that this one day will happen to me. George, like his grandfather, may well have a long time as an apprentice. He may well also be an older king. It will be useful for him to just tell his story to, to George, because there is a big responsibility. You know, George can't have the sort of crazy teenage years that maybe his siblings can have. You can see that George is going to have to carve out a role for himself in exactly the same way as his grandfather, Charles, did. And while George's future seems set in stone, his siblings is less certain. Charlotte and Louis are going to have to find their place in Charles's new, slim-down monarchy. He's going to be acutely aware that Charlotte and Louis are going to have to find their own paths in life, are going to, in the future, not be working roles. So what education should they be getting now? Should Louis go into the military, as pretty much all of his male uh, relatives have done? All of these questions are things that will be being discussed right now. And while they might not become working royals, Charles and Camilla must be conscious that Charlotte and Louis still have a place in the succession. Prince Harry has often spoken of the psychological damage he feels was caused by being the spare to his elder brother, William, the royal heir. Charlotte is the spare. She is being trained for the crown just in case something happens to her older brother, George. Part of what Harry's angst is linked to the fact that he, as the spare, didn't ever feel that he fitted in. He felt that the institution failed to provide him with a legitimate and fulfilling role. I think it would be really worthwhile, Charles, as a good grandfather, to explain to the other two that they're not just spare, they're not just surplus to requirements. And while the lives of the royal grandchildren seem predetermined, the same cannot be said for Camilla's grandchildren. Camilla's grandchildren kind of almost do have that half-in, half-out position. They're not royal, but they will probably benefit from the sort of the royal stardust. Now that Camilla is queen, it won't be possible for her to keep her grandchildren out of the spotlight. The moment there's a crown on your head, the world is interested and it wants gossip. Camilla's grandchildren will always be of interest to the press. Um, let's hope it doesn't get too intrusive for them. They will want to build their own careers, their own lives. We might be seeing more of Camilla's grandchildren in the future, but according to Tom Parker Bowles on the News Agents podcast, that won't involve them being a formal part of the firm. But does it feel weird for you to start sort of Having thinking to of her to your, as, your, yeah, as the Queen? Not really, because she's still, you know, our mother. I say our, oh, speaking not, not the royal we, speaking for my sister and me. <laughs> um, but she is our, yeah, she's our mother, and it's, I think, 
change happens. But I don't care what anyone says. This wasn't any sort of end game. She married the person she loved and this is what happened. Anyway, you're not going to find us with sort of great estates and being called the Duke of whatever. No, that would be appalling. The Duke of Tom. Neither Tom nor Laura are really interested in that side of things. And who can blame them? I mean, they want their children to have as normal an upbringing as possible. Please welcome Meghan and Harry, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. And across the Atlantic, the Sussexes continue to make a new life in America. Is there any hope for reconciliation between them and the royal family in the future? I very much doubt that Charles is ever going to go and stay at Montecito with, hi, Grandpa Wales just popping in. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Charles just doesn't roll like that. It's up to them to make the concession and to come here. But if they don't do that, the Charles will not see his grandchildren. In this recent insightful ITV interview, Harry expressed his desire to heal the rift, but it came with conditions. I sit here now in front of you asking for a family, not an institution, I want a family. For the time being, the Sussexes and the royal family will be leading separate lives. However, like with many other families, the key to bringing them back together already exists. I don't feel that, that they've totally burnt their bridges with the royal family because I don't think Charles would do that. It's his son. Grandchildren sometimes can be key to a, a family reuniting and, and healing those wounds. And I'm sure a lot of people hope eventually that can happen with Harry. Whatever the future brings, one thing is clear, that King Charles and Queen Camilla only want the best for their grandchildren. I'm sure the overriding factor for Charles with all of them is that they're happy and, and well-balanced and, and well-loved. Why are we obsessed with royal grandchildren? It speaks to stability, continuity, that while we might have an elderly monarch, which we now have with Charles, we still have the youth and vigour, the green shoots of what's to come. And Prince Harry's secrets of his Hollywood life are explored brand new next Saturday at five past nine. This week in the Caribbean, Ben Fogel explores the buried city, meeting those who, whose lives were torn apart by a huge volcanic eruption. That's brand new Tuesday at nine. Next, soap stars go horribly wrong. <laughs>